And Jesus was turned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, hometown, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for the read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus returns this scripture, finds Jesus in the early part of his ministry, and he has been going around all the regions of Galilee, and, and as was his custom we see here, he would go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he would teach. Uh, at, at the time, uh, the synagogue was a place much like the church is now. People would go into the synagogue on the Sabbath and they would sing songs of praise to God. And they would listen to the reading of the Scripture and they would hear a sermon or a lesson by a rabbi, which is just another word for a teacher. Now, any, any man that, that attended the synagogue, any, any Jewish man that attended the synagogue could be called upon to read from the Scripture. Much like we do with whoever leads the devotional. This will be my week to read the Scripture. Next week, maybe Bobby. You know, that's, that's how it would work. So Jesus, Him coming back to His hometown, they probably said, well, we'll let uh, Jesus, the son of Joseph, do it this week since He has returned to us from, from far off. And Jesus was delivered, it said it was delivered unto Him um, the book of Isaiah. Now, at this point, of course, they weren't actually books. They were scrolls. Mm -hmm. Come on, Jack. And scrolls, I mean, this is 1,500 years before the invention of the printing press. So, each of those scrolls were hand copied. And that meant that each one of these scrolls were incredibly expensive because they, had to, they were handmade. Each and every one of them. And Jesus, we know, came from a poor part of the country. So we know that probably this was not a very wealthy synagogue. This was not a very elegant building. This was probably just a humble little place. But they had set it aside for the worship and the learning about God. So we can think, because, I mean, this, this Bible as we know it today, the reason we all have one in our laps is because of the invention of the printing press and, and, and how cheap that has made the printed word. This synagogue in, in, in uh, Nazareth might not have even had a full set of the Scriptures. Thank you, but they would have Isaiah. Yeah. Because Isaiah was an important... Uh, the, the book of Isaiah was an important work and it was full of messianic prophecies. It was full of prophecies Isaiah had received from God about the coming Messiah. So in this, in this, uh, this morning that that Jesus went into the synagogue. They decided that He would read that morning and they gave Him the book of Isaiah. It was uh, the book of Isaiah, Zach, was the first sought after. Mm -hmm. uh, they would, when, when folks would uh, say, well, we're going to get us a scroll. We're going to get the Word of God. They said, now the first one we're going to get to Isaiah. We yeah. can't afford any more. We're going to get one, Isaiah. Because that's the one where our hope lies. But let me, okay, so they delivered to Jesus. And the way they would do this, the men would stand, as, as I'm doing this morning, they would stand before the congregation and they would read from these scrolls. And the, the, um, the tradition at the time was that they would read at least a couple dozen verses. But Jesus, <laughs> always being one to be just a little bit theatrical, Come on, buddy. just a little bit bold, he just read two and sat down. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. Jesus leaves out something from those verses. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. Isaiah, this scripture that Jesus was reading from that morning, was one of those prophecies that Isaiah had had about the coming Messiah. The one that God had promised the children of Israel that would come and deliver them out of their bondage. Isaiah, the way he writes about the Messiah, calls to mind um, what they would call the year of Jubilee. He writes about the acceptable year of the Lord, which was a wor words that were frequently used when they would talk about Jubilee. Now for those of you that haven't read the book of Leviticus, that's where God laid out all of His laws and His observances. He gave them to Moses to teach to the children of Israel. We know that every seven days they would observe a Sabbath. Yeah, buddy. And on the Sabbath, you weren't allowed to work. You weren't allowed to do anything. You weren't allowed to burn a candle. You weren't allowed to cook. You weren't allowed to reap anything from the fields. So if you were going to eat anything, you had to make preparations the day before to make sure you had enough. And that happened every seven days. It was a day appointed to rest and to think on God. Now that was the Sabbath day. Every seven years... From the time they entered into the promised land, they were required to observe what was called a Sabbath year. And the Sabbath year was much like a Sabbath day. You weren't supposed to plant anything in your fields that year. God, it was, it was a way for God to instill on the children of Israel that they were to depend upon Him. It was a, it was a year of rest for the land to allow the, the processes of nature to take hold and to replenish what they had taken out of it the previous six years. But it was also a way for God to instill in His people that even if you don't plant anything in your fields, I'm going to take care of it. Amen. They were only allowed to eat what the fields brought forth naturally. And that happened every seven years. Now, they that happened every seven years. Now, every seventh Sabbath year, Every occur which would occur every it would be seven times seven is forty nine. So the year after that would be known as the year of jubilee. This is the seventh Sabbath, and the year of jubilee was unlike anything that I have never heard of anything like this in anywhere. It certainly I don't think it exists anywhere in the modern era. I've never read anything in the in the historic era of where it happened. This is, is something that, that is so uncomprehendable to our modern American capitalist. I mean, Americans, we like to own stuff, right? right? We like to own stuff. We like to have a house. We like to have property. We like to have cars and boats. We like that. But in the year of Jubilee, every 50 years, God commanded Moses that the children of Israel, any land they had on, purchased in the last 50 years, would be returned to its original owner. <laughs> Every 50 years, no matter what you had accumulated within the last 50 years, it would return to its original owner. Going back to the time that the children of Israel settled the promised land, everything was returned to the families that it belonged to. And that wasn't the only thing. In the <coughs> Jubilee year. See, slavery, we think of slavery in the American context where we went over and, and stole people from their homeland and brought them here and enslaved them. But slavery was different, a little more humane in, in ancient Israel. See, slavery was a way, if you were destitute and, and poor, if you had no other option, if you were completely broke, you could make some money by selling yourself into indentured servitude to somebody else. You said, I will be your slave for this appointed amount of time. And they would pay for you and take care of you and give money to your families. 
Now you could buy yourself out of slavery. But on the Jubilee year, it didn't matter how long you'd been a slave. It didn't matter how much debt you had incurred to this master that you had. Every slave was set free in the year of Jubilee. Every man was returned to his family. No matter how much debt he had incurred, it was all forgiven. Yes, and he was returned a free man to his family. And Isaiah, we see in, in chapter 61, he calls to mind that when he talks about the Messiah that's coming, he's talking about a year of jubilee that will come with it. He says, The Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings into the meek. Jesus, it was a little different translation. Jesus said it as to preach the gospel, which is the good news, to the poor. Think about that. The year of Jubilee, the people that were poor, the people that had come on hard times, had sold everything that they had. Come on, son. But in the year of Jubilee, oh, the yeah. land of their fathers and restored. grandfathers and great grandfathers, it was all restored to them. The people that had fallen so far that they had sold themselves into slavery were set they free. free. Amen. He hath sent me to bind up the broken heart. To proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to the slaves, and the opening of prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Isaiah in his prophecy about the Messiah says that when this deliverer comes, he's going to bring with him a year of jubilee like we have never seen before. A year of deliverance like we have never seen before. And Jesus, because He was the one that inspired Isaiah to write this anyway, just took a little creative liberty when He was reading there. And He added something. Jesus said, He borrowed a scripture from elsewhere in Isaiah. He added the recovery of sight to the blind. Amen. Bless the Lord. And we know that as Jesus was traveling around and performing miracles, the blind were receiving their sight in more ways than one. There were the people that were physically yes. blind. Yes. And they received their sight. But there were people that were spiritually yes. blind. That had lost sight of what God wanted Lord. from them. And Jesus was giving them a new way to relate to the Father. The good news of the Gospel that Jesus was talking about was a different kind of freedom than they were used to in the year of Jubilee. Just as God... See, the reason God had instituted Jubilee to begin with, I didn't talk about this earlier, it was to remind the children of Israel that nothing they had was theirs. That the only reason that they lived in this place, that God had brought them out of bondage in Egypt, and delivered them through all of those battles and trials in the wilderness, all of those people that they had to go to war against. The only reason that they had made it into Canaan was because of God's hand on them. So God wanted this uh, year of Jubilee to remind them that I don't care what you have accumulated in yourself. I don't care what you have done. It wasn't yours anyway. Amen. So I'm going to restore everything that you had. No matter how much land you, you got off of your neighbors, no matter how dirty your business dealings were, no matter how much physical, earthly wealth you had accumulated, it wasn't yours anyway. Come on, son. <coughs> Jesus, meanwhile, talking about His kind of year of Jubilee, through His redeeming sacrifice, says that you are restored because your inheritance was never yours to give away to begin with. Jesus came to restore people because our inheritance was never ours anyway. We are made free because we were never ourselves anyway. Paul said, you remember in 1 Corinthians, he said, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Jesus said, you might have sold yourself into slavery, but I'm going to restore you because it wasn't ever yours to give away anyway. Come on, Zach. It 
It reminds you of that tale of the prodigal son who had requested his inheritance of his father and went and spent it all. But when he came back to the house, his father restored him just as he was before. Because the inheritance wasn't ever his anyway. It was his father's to give to him. But Jesus left something out in Isaiah chapter 61. He says that he, come to, he, he came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But Isaiah goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Jesus left out when he was reading in the synagogue that morning that part about the day of vengeance. It was right there in the middle of the verse. He skipped over it. Why? Why would he skip over it? It was right there. I'll tell you, if he left that part out about the day of vengeance. Because that part of his mission wasn't here. Yet. He was here to bring jubilee, not vengeance. Christians, and I am guilty of this myself, when somebody, I feel like somebody has done me wrong, I want to rain holy fire onto their heads sometimes. <laughs> Are you right? God, they, oh, take care of them. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Beat them up. Strike them down. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? That has been a Christian attitude since the very beginning. The disciples that walked right with Jesus. They were in Samaria, Samaria one time preaching, and the Samaritans didn't want to hear what they said, and they were so mad. They said, let's, you know what, Jesus? God rained fire down for Elijah. Let's do the same thing. Burn him. Burn him to a crisp. <laughs> and Jesus looked at him, and you it's can imagine, he was, I mean, I read the words with just so much disappointment. Yeah. He said, boys, you don't know what kind of spirit you're of. Yeah. I just imagine him looking at him with his mouth open. And he said, have you not listened to anything? I, you I don't know what you kind know? of spirit you've been hanging out with. He said, the Son of Man, guys, <laughs> did not come to destroy me. Yeah, bless the Lord. He came to save them. Yeah, amen. Love. In terms of Jubilee, he said, the Son of Man didn't come to take anything from you. Yeah, come on, to you. We quote that Scripture so much that He came to give us life and life more abundantly. Yeah. Think about the word abundantly. If you, have so, if you have an abundance of something, you have more of it. So He says... <laughs> I came to give you life and life more abundantly. I came to give you life and not just life, but more of it. Yes. yes. He said, I didn't come to take anything from you. I came to give you something. Yes. I didn't come to turn you into a captive. I came to make you free. If you read in the book of Revelation, we see that eventually Jesus will fulfill that latter part of that Scripture, that He will bring the day of vengeance of God. But until then, until then, from the day that Jesus read that Scripture in that synagogue to right now in 2014, May the 11th, Mother's Day, the, the day of Jubilee, the year of Jubilee is here and will be here until God proclaims that time will be no more. We are living in a year of jubilee. We are living in a time of restoration. We are living in a time of freedom. The door of mercy until God declares that time is over is wide open for anybody that wants to come and accept this freedom that is being offered. So in closing, if we are still living below our means spiritually, if we have given away all of the blessings that God has given us, it's the year of Jubilee. It's ours if we want it. No. Though we have given it all away, God says it was never yours to begin with. I gave that to you. Amen. If we don't accept it, that's our fault. I'm telling you, if we are still living in our slave master's house, and this goes to the Christians and the non-Christians alike, if we are still living like a slave, 
That's nobody's fault but our own. Amen. Because it is the year of Jubilee. The prisoners have been made free. The price has been paid. We have been bought out of slavery. We are free to return to the family that we came from. If we are still living in our slave master's house, it's our own fault because Amen. it's the year yes. of Jubilee. Yes. Bless you, sir. The year of Jubilee is here, right now. And we'll be here until Jesus comes back. So, I want us to start acting. I need to start acting like I am free. Amen. Yeah. Because even though at one point I sold myself into bondage, uh -huh. I was never mine anyway. Amen. It was never mine to give away. Come on, sir. I am free because the Messiah has come. He has yes. preached the good news to the poor. Yes. He has healed the broken heart. Yes. He has preached deliverance to the captives. He has recovered the sight of the blind. <laughs> he has set at liberty them that are bruised. And He has preached the acceptable year of the Lord. Yes, exactly. It's Jubilee, so I'm going to start acting like Amen. Amen. Thank you. Bless your heart.